Good day, everybody. We're going over Notebook 8. So i um, like you to go ahead and pause the video and get Notebook 8 open. It's called Line Plots. And so a lot of times um, this particular plot does a very good job of showing trends over time. There are a couple of other situations we use it in as well. And you saw these line plots in the very first notebook we looked at, um, uh, uh, the textbook looked at, right, with the Huck Finn and the Little Women um, examples. And so there's a lot of uses for them. And when they work, they work really well. Okay, so the first thing we have to do, honestly, is clean up a data file that's a bit of a mess. And so we're going to use a dot select. We're going to get it. We're going to only select columns that we're interested in so that we can make some sense of it. And we're going to use dot relabeled. And so this is going to allow us to create far better column titles. And you'll see in just a second why we need better column titles. OK, so um, we're going to investigate sex and they have sex options 0, 1, 2. And age is like 999. Now we've seen this data set before, but again, these are some weird, <laughs> some weird codes. So we're going to have to crack the code here. And I also want to remind you that relabeled is, is a new uh, method that we're looking at. And it can be very helpful, but it's only helpful sometimes. So in other words, it's not one of the, like the top five most used methods that's most important to this course. But it's a really helpful tool when and if we need it. So I want to point that out. Really helpful, but not used terribly much. It's used some, but not all that much. Let me get rid of the ink, and then we'll check out this notebook. All right, so make sure you initialize the first block code block there. And then here is the census table. All right, and when we pull it in, to Python and print out a copy, we see we have over 300 rows. And we have these terribly ugly column titles. And we can see that it looks like it deals with population estimates in a certain year. And this is why I was saying that we're going to, hey, OK, <laughs> the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to create this table partial, which is the full table, but we're only selecting four columns out of it. Okay, so this is a little easier to deal with. We can see we're dealing with population estimates from 2010 and population estimates from 2014. All right, and here's the second one where we're going to use relabeled and we're going to make column two, we're going to relabel it 2010. So remember that column zero is the first column, the computer starts counting at zero, so column zero is sex, column, column one is age, column two is pop estimate 2010, and column three is pop estimate 24. So down here we see that we're doing the dot relabeled for column two and calling it 2010, and dot relabeled for column three and calling it 2014. So this just makes the table really nice and easy to see. All right, we can see which year we're talking about. We know we're talking about population figures, okay? And then, we're doing this simple. So this is this is what our new table is called. It's called simple. So when we do simple dot sort by age, we are very much getting um, a sorted table from age zero on up, right? So we're sorting based on the age column. Let me get rid of that ink now that you see it. Okay. Um, and <laughs> please notice that the sex zero is actually the sum of sexes one and two. In other words, sexes one and two are relating are are, are related to males and females, and zero is the combination of both males and females. Okay, so what we do, getting rid of the ink here, uh, what we do, um. <laughs> is we sort it the other way using descending equals true. And remember, I've shown this before, but you don't necessarily need the uh, descending equals because there's only really one option for sort. And if you just say true, it does the same thing. And this will explain why we're doing where dot where method 
and using age r dot below 999. Okay, we want them strictly below 999. Why? We want to get rid of these three rows up here. Why? Well, they're totals, right? This is the total number of people alive on the planet or in the US. I can't tell exactly what it is. Um, that must be the United States. Um, but I'll <laughs> see. Yeah, so we're talking about 310 million, which is more like a US population uh, than a world population, um, which in 2010 would be more like 5 billion. Okay, so um, let me get rid of the ink. Right, so this is a nice table where we're getting rid of the 999s, which are totals that we don't want. And then here we're creating the table everyone, which is no 999, right? We just got rid of the 999s by using a dot where and an r dot below. Okay, and then here where sex is equal to zero, and then we're dropping the sex. Okay, let's do that and print everyone out. Why? Well, okay, so now these are population totals for that age in that year. And maybe that is a world population. I don't know. I, I have to, th I don't know exactly what this is. Um, so there were 3.9 million um, persons age zero. Again, that's uh, babies that have been born but are not yet to their first birthday. Age one, they have had their first birthday but not their second and so forth. So we see that for 2010 and for 2014. Okay, and by choosing sex equals zero, we don't have um different rows for males and females and total right we just are taking uh dot where to just get the totals the sex equals zero is the total row for that uh for that age okay and here we finally get to the part we've been headed towards all right so we've done all of this we've cleaned up the data we did a couple more things to clean up the data again we used the sex equals zero because that will count both sexes combined and then we dropped sex so we're only showing age and the population columns for 2010 and 2014. all right and to draw the line plot what do we need to do this is all we have to do and whatever the table name is we put that in here i just put that in as a placeholder our table is called everywhere but we do the table name dot plot and then the variable that we want to go along the x-axis we put first and the variable that we want to go along the y-axis we put second and then I want you to think about this question if we just get rid of that what will happen okay so I am going to get rid of the ink and let's go check that out okay so Everyone dot plot again, age is the X variable, 2010 is the Y variable. So you see that these population numbers are on the Y axis and the age in years is along the X axis. And exactly what you think um, after a certain point, like say 60 years old, right? The population for that age starts dropping, okay? We have a pretty steady first 60 years, and yes, there are some increases because more people are being born, and there are some decreases because, sadly, not everyone um, is alive past the age of 30 or 40, and we start to see some ups and downs. Again, there are still there are births going on um, every year, and so the population does go up and down but again for the first 60 years it's staying relatively steady and then of course we see a drop off as people get to these elderly ages okay so, so this is a, a nice plot and oh it is u.s population okay that's good um and it turns out that we can add a title to it. And this is one way. We can just 
use this print statement. And why? Well, it will do this and it prints out US population. Okay. But there's another way to do it, and we can do this with almost all kind with most kinds of plots. We can just add a second line right below the everyone plot. Right? So after the everyone.plot, if we add plots.title US population, it'll put it on the graph for us. There we go. So now we have the same graph that we've been looking at, but it's got a nice title. And again, you can change the text in red inside the quotes and you know make that whatever title you would like. Okay, and here's the question that I asked, right? I asked, what if we delete the 2010? And here you go, here it is. Now this is awesome. So let me jump back up here and add something in Y, because I want you to look at everyone. I just want you to see what that table is, okay? So the table, we when we just specify the X variable, right? We say, hey, X variable is going to be H and we don't specify a y variable down here, then it uses everything it has as a y variable. So it's got two columns. It's got 2010 first, and that's its first y variable. Then it creates another line plot for 2014. So this is really nice. When we just specify the x, right, then it splits up the graph and shows us a line plot for all of the remaining columns. Now, this is another reason why we use dot select and dot drop, right? We didn't want plots for all the columns, right? So we did a dot select. We ended up with two or three columns. In this case, we had three, right? And so this is a good use of dot select and dot drop. Get rid of the columns that we aren't analyzing. So, and then I can just say, hey, do everyone dot plot age. And that'll be my X variable. And then it'll plot both 2010 and 2014 populations um, on, the same, on the same graph, all right? So let me get rid of the ink and scroll down. So this is nice. And notice that when we do this, and it ends up that there are two columns out here, right? So I'll put, <laughs> I'll put Y sub one and Y sub two. There are actually two columns out here. So what does it do? It creates a legend for us and says, hey, the dark blue is 2010 values and the gold is 2014 values. And notice that the 2014 values look like the 2010 values just shifted a little bit to the right. Both the dark blue graph and the gold graph are very, very, very similar. Okay, are there some differences? Yes, yes. Okay, because. Um, People, babies are born between 2010 and 2014, and sadly, there are some people who pass away um, between 2010 and 2014. So do the, do the gold and blue exactly match? No, no, the gold and the blue do not exactly match, but, but they get really close to being an exact match, okay? Um, so we're going to do a breakdown by this variable sex. This is biological sex. So when we say male and female, we're not talking about gender. We're talking about biological sex. And what the notebook does is it compares males versus females over time. And some of the questions we can ask are, you know, hey, what percentage of the population is born female? And then we can also ask the question, who lives longer on average, females or males? So those are some of the things that we can look at. And we can use these line plots to help try to tell the story of what's going on. Okay, so here we go, males and females in 2014. So notice we create an array called males. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a table. And it's the no 999 table where sex equals one, so that must be the males, and dot drop sex, and then the females is the same thing, but sex equals two, dot where sex equals two, and then drop, okay? And so now, um, population 2014 is table with columns, and notice what we're doing. We're going into males and doing dot column age. 
Okay, so we go into this table and do a dot column. Why? Well, this is supposed to specify the array that's supposed to go in the age column. So this says this dot with columns, remember, it tells us, hey, here's the name of the column, and here's the array of data that needs to go in the column. And then it tells us males, and we do males.column2014, and then we have females and females.column2014. And all that does is put together a nice new table called population 2014. And we can see as the ages increase the differences between male and female, uh, their parts of the population. And again, we have two numeric columns and we just specify the x-axis that we want. It'll plot the other two and give us a legend and here we go. So we have males versus females. Males are the dark blue, females are the gold. And I want you to look at this. So what ages are these? These are like ages zero to 10 is what I've circled. Uh, what does this mean? Again, this answers the first question we asked, which was, you know, when human babies are born, is there a 50-50 split? And the answer is not quite. It's really close to 50-50, but slightly more male babies are born than females. And you can see that. It's not a huge difference, but it's slight. It's slight. Okay. And But notice that right in here, right, around the age of 30 or 35, these two lines cross. And then further over into the 40s, 50s, 60s, and above, it looks like the gold line is higher. What does that mean? Well, that helps answer the second question, which is who lives longer, females or males? And it turns out that females have more longevity. So even though a higher percentage of males, again, it's slight, a slightly higher percentage, um, I don't even think it's 51-49. I think it's even less of a split than that. It's really, really close to 50-50. But there is a point somewhere here in the graph around the age of 30 to 35 where that crosses over. And why? Because females, the gold line, um, have a longer lifespan. And so after a while, there's a higher percentage of that age population that is female rather than male. Even though fewer females were born percentage-wise, um, you know, by the 50s, by their 50s, 60s, and 70s, a larger percentage of the population is female um, rather than male. Okay, and so that is an okay way to see it. It's, uh, but the notebook goes on, and what the heck are they doing here? So they're, they're creating these, um, so total is population column 14 plus population um, 2014 column females, percent female, they're creating this percent female column. So we have this percent female array. And these are just percentages of the population. And so when they're born, right around 49% of the population are female. And again, they're just rounding all these numbers to three, so they're a little easier to read, a little easier to understand. Okay. And so now we've just added that row, that, that, to population 2014, we've added percent female column, and we've used the percent female array to do so. Okay. And you can see if we plot the percentage, this is, this is what I was trying to explain, that just slightly less than 50% of the babies born are female, just slightly less, okay? But look, this is percentage of the population that's female. Okay, and then notice that there's this there's this period in here around age 30 where we get this crossing over the 50%, where by age 40 and above, it appears that the 
percentage of females of you know that age of the population is higher than 50 percent and by the time we get you know over 80 years old right or an over 90 years old it's a lot more than 50 percent right um, by the time we get into the 90s, it looks like 70% of the population, 90 and older, um, is in fact female. Um, so, so that's interesting. So, what do we do next? Um, okay, so here they do it um, from. They they okay. <laughs> they've they've reconfigured this plot just slightly. Is there something here you need to know? No, we're fine. Okay. And then notice that they're doing the same thing that we did before with female. They're doing it with percent male and they're adding to population 24, 2014, a uh, dot with columns so are adding this column that's titled percent male and has this array percent male. And when we execute this, okay. So now we've added two columns. Okay, and when we plot age, this is going to look kind of ugly. Um, we still get this graph that we've seen before with the males and females, but it turns out that the percent male, percent female are really hard to see. Why? Well, because their values between zero and one. And, you know, and here we're talking about two and a half million. So on a scale that goes from zero to two and a half million and only a couple of inches, um, it's really hard to see any difference between the percent male and percent female. Okay, so it will draw a line plot for every column that's remaining. Okay, that's not always helpful. I want to point that out, right? It did, in fact, draw a line plot for males, for females, and it did draw a line plot for both of these, but they're really hard to see because they look like the x-axis and then the dark green one covers the dark blue one. And so we can't really see all that well. So this isn't particularly helpful. I mean, it's it's nice that we have this capability to do four at once, but putting four at once on the same graph turns out to not be that helpful. It doesn't tell a very good visual story. Okay. Um, and... Oh, I'm sorry, I thought that they had another one. Here, let's do this. Let's just drop. Um, oh, capital M. Let's drop males. Um, sorry. And then the comma here, and then drop females. Why? Because then when we plot age, what we're doing is we're getting rid of these. And we're only going to plot the percent female and percent male. All right, let's get rid of that ink so you can see how this works. And then let's run it. Okay, so this is really interesting now. I can actually see something. This is the story we've been tr I've been trying to communicate. That yes, it appears the percent male is slightly higher than the percent female at birth. But there's this crossing over point that happens here in the, I don't know, early 30s. And what does this mean? It means that the females for ages 70, 80, 90, at those ages, they're a much higher percentage of that age of the population. So if we look at 80-year-olds, right, 80-year-olds, um, it looks like somewhere in the high 50s, like 57% of 80 year olds are female. And if we look at the same for males, it looks like only about 43% of the uh, population of 80 year olds is male. Again, with the females being the, uh, having lo uh, higher longevity, right? So if the females live longer, that's why the dark blue is jumping up at the right side of this graph and why the percent male is tailing off at the right side of this graph. So let me get rid of the ink. That is in fact the story, the narrative we're trying to show. And so what's going on here um, is, and I want to ask you this, right? 
did the line plot do a good job of telling a story based on this data? And you're going to have your own opinions about this. And I'm going to say, in fact, yes. Um, when we worked at it and when we selected the right data, the right columns, um, and we cleaned up the data a little bit, yeah, we were able to tell a pretty interesting story just using these population numbers. Okay, so I would say yes, it does tell a good, it does do a good job of telling a story, but it took some work. And then let's also just admit right up front that not every situation should we use line plots. Okay, so so we're going to go through some examples that actually show an example of when not to use line plots, but line plots can do a really good job of telling a story, uh, showing us something that's in the data, um, but they're not perfect. Um, and that's true for most of the visualizations we use. Some of the visualizations are just great in certain areas. And in some areas, let's be honest, they suck. Um, but that's what we're, that's why we have multiple uh, visualizations that we can use. Let's jump back in and look at a couple of these uh, examples. This is Boyle's Law. Um, and so if we load the data and then we can plot pressure. Okay, and the friend tells us that if we plot 1 over P against volume instead, we should get a line, right? So that has to do with Boyle's Law. Um, and yeah, if you think about it, what are they doing? They're talking about dividing through by P. So we have a 1 over P on the right-hand side, which is what they do here. This may not make sense to you until you realize the double asterisks are exponents and an exponent to the minus one. So if I have like, let's say the number three raised to the minus one power, that's equal to one third, right? Remember we move that whole number to the denominator and change the sign of the exponent to positive, all right? So, so that's what's going on. We're just doing one over P, right? That's this part. And we're taking the whole column and doing it to every single value in there. We're doing 1 over P. And interesting. Okay, so it is a straight line. So instead of the curving line that we had before, now we have a straight line. So there does appear to be a linear relationship between 1 over P um, and volume. Okay, interesting. And here's an example of when line plots are not appropriate. Okay, so we're looking at the Charles Law data. And this is weird. Okay. Um, and we're going to look at the scatter plot just to see what's going on. And look at this, right? So we have a data point down here. And we have some data that seems to be going along one linear one linear path we have some data that seems to be going on a different linear path all right and what does that do when we look at it up here it can't tell it's just jumping back and forth from one linear path to the other and so this line plot doesn't really produce helpful information for us the scatter plot is tells a better story about what's going on. And this is a fun one about top movies, okay? And so top 10 adjusted, we're going to take the first 10 movies, okay? And here we go. And we're adding the column millions if you want to take a look at this. Millions is an array um, so we're taking this gross adjusted divided by a million, and then we're creating a new table that has this new column, millions. Okay, so this is adjusted gross in millions, okay? And look at this. Look at Gone with the Wind, <laughs> which, um, again, adjusted, this gross adjusted, it's the gross dollars spent on tickets adjusted for inflation. Well, you got to remember, Gone with the Wind is in the 1930s, right? 1939. Okay, so there was a lot of inflation then until uh, Star Wars and some of these other huge movies, um, you know, Titanic, 
Um, but in adjusted dollars, Gone with the Wind sold more total tick. If you think about the number of tickets sold, right? Um, in in adjusted dollars, it looks like Gone with the Wind was more popular than Star Wars and more popular than Titanic and some of these amazingly popular movies. Okay, so, so this is an interesting one. And then, <laughs> but if we plot it, it just looks like hieroglyphics. Why? Well, a line plot just doesn't make sense here. Yeah, it is interesting data, but we can't see which movies are which. And so, yeah, this is another situation where a line plot probably doesn't make sense. And they're saying, hey, look at the bar H. Oh, okay. So now we can see, and the bars represent the, the millions of, of gross dollars spent by moviegoers on seeing these movies. And we can compare using that bar graph. So, so we, again, is a line plot always the best visualization? No, no. Sometimes something like a bar graph, a horizontal uh, bar graph, is the way to go. Um, uh, this table certainly has interesting information. And um, actors in their highest growth, grossing movies. Okay, so we have some of the big stars of current and yesteryear, you know, Harrison Ford, Samuel Jackson, Morgan Freeman, Tom Hanks. And you can see um, we have the total gross uh, amount for all the movies they were in, the number of movies they were in, the average per movie. Okay. So we're plotting actors and what you'd think is that this should be going up. And generally speaking, the graph does kind of go up. The line plot does kind of go up. But right, the number of movies they're in, you know, an actor that's in a lot more movies should make a lot more gross. Those movies should make a lot more gross. Well, only if they're popular movies, right? So if you're in a lot of movies, but they're not as popular, you might be in this part of the graph, right? And if you're in fewer movies, but they're popular, you know, you might be in this part of the graph. But this doesn't really tell us much of a story. So let's try actors.scatter. Okay, so this is a scatter plot of the same data. And, and this is interesting. Okay. Um, and then instead of doing um, the total gross, what if we do number of movies in average per movie? I do a scatter plot of that. And holy smokes, there's an outlier. Okay, so there is this outlier here. Everything else seems to be, I mean, it may not be a linear pattern, but there's a definite pattern to the other data points. But this is a stark outlier where somebody's averaging over $400 million per movie. Okay. <laughs> so let's find out who that is. And we're going to do average per movie R dot above 400, right? So if we're going <laughs> to... We're just going to draw a line here and say, hey, higher than that. Okay. And then what's that going to do? That's just going to take the table and produce one row. And it's going to tell us who this actor is. And then we find out that the actor is Anthony Daniels. And we don't know this guy. It's not Tom Hanks or Harrison Ford or Samuel Jackson or Denzel Washington. It's not one of these great actors that we would suspect of having a hugely popular string of movies. But notice that even though it's it's over 400 million, he wasn't in that many movies. You'd figure if a guy was this good, that he could, uh, that the movies he was in would draw, you know, would, would gross over 400 million average, uh, you know, that he'd be in more movies. And then we look at, oh, it's a Star Wars character, and it's not Harrison Ford, and it's not Luke Skywalker or, you know, Carrie Fisher. You know, it's not, it's not some of these major actors or actresses that we know of. Who's Anthony Daniels? And I'm pretty sure if you look it up, it's C-3PO. So we have the actor <laughs> for C-3PO who only did like eight movies and, oh yeah, seven movies. 
And yeah, they were all Star Wars movies, and they all grossed a lot of money, right? So it turns out, if you look at the gross per movie, um, he is a stark outlier, uh, a very striking outlier. Okay, so so that's a fun one um, that we can find out. And then the actor's average per movie. So if we if we eliminate the outlier, notice that we get an actual pattern here in the scatter plot. Is it linear? Not quite. It looks like it may bend a little bit uh, there in the middle, but there is an obvious pattern. Okay. Now, is it always appropriate to delete the outlier? No. No, it's not. Um, and I want to make that clear. We don't just delete outliers. However, <laughs> it is sometimes important to identify outliers. Why? Because sometimes the outliers can point to some really interesting aspect of the data set. Okay, so when we do find outliers, it is important to at least take a look at them and see if we can understand why those outliers exist. And again, this is a fun one. Um, and you can Google Anthony Daniels and see which character he was. I'm thinking C-3PO or R2-D2. I'm, I'm guessing one of the droids, but I don't know. Maybe you could just Google Anthony Daniels and find out. And that's all I have for you. Have a great day.